Hey there friends, Dave Flight of Scanner Missing Project, cup ready to edition for our video channel. And uh, Huck is in the room, so Huck TV is on. She just got up and she just walked off, so she saw the beginning and she saw enough. Uh, <clears throat> give you a little update. The movie premiere for Missing 411, The UFO Connection, is still on track. We're doing really well. Uh, it's going to be November 12th in Tempe, Arizona, uh, just a suburb of Phoenix. Uh, it's the same facility where I spoke at uh, a week ago. Uh, it's a beautiful museum there. We've uh, arranged to have a catered meal, and this catering firm is really good. Catered meal, we're going to have the movie shown. And then after the movie, we're going to have a break, and then we're going to get back together. And I'm going to be on stage, and I'm going to be answering questions, and I'm going to be calling up some people in the audience that you're going to be stunned that are there, that are going to talk, give us their opinion. But uh, they're all people that you know and uh, have been big supporters over the years. So I already talked to them, and they said, yeah, we'll talk. Oh, this is exciting. So uh, it's going to be a good time. Hope you can make it. The link is at the pinned comment, the first comment right underneath the screen. If you scroll down and you read the comments of our videos, you can post a comment if you don't know. And then there's right below the screen, if you click on the Can-Am logo, it'll take you to all of our videos. And there's over 340 of them right now. And the movie trailer's there, and uh, kind of my behind the scenes talk about the movie and how it got made and etc. So this is a missing person segment. So we're going to talk about missing people and we're going to talk about some letters that came in that are very interesting this week. So away we go. First of all, the value of the village. Today I'm going to talk to you about two missing person stories that came through members of the village. Uh, one from France and one from Alaska. And the one from Alaska is very current, and we're going to ask for some people to jump in on that and see if we can help. But, uh, yeah, the power of the village. If uh, you know of a case that's going on in your area, send me an email about it. And at the minimum, I'll give it huge publicity, try to get some search and rescue people out there. And uh, thanks for the heads up. First story, Dave, uh, I'm greatly looking forward to your new docu-movie. Well, thank you very much. I'll be watching it as soon as it comes out. Thank you for that. Now, one thing all of you can do, every one of you, and this is really important, post the link to that trailer to your social media. It's a small thing for me to ask. It doesn't cost you anything. The trailer's free and it will give our cause a lot more exposure to let people know what's going on. Uh, you'd be surprised, probably 99.9999% of the public has never heard about us or what we do or the missing person issue. So if you could post that link, I'd be grateful. So uh, let's see. I've also been enjoying your book review of Skinwalker Ranch videos. I purchased the book myself and I'm halfway through reading it. It's a book that's hard to put down. In regards to Skinwalker Ranch and the mineral you mentioned called Gilsonite, in case you guys missed it, I did a series, kind of a book review, on the first Skinwalker book and on the second one. The first one we're still in process and we're going to do another one next week, but the second book, it's in the, it's in the can and you can watch it right now. Just click on the Can-Am logo, it'll take you to all of our videos. In regards to Skinwalker Ranch and the mineral Gilsonite, I did a search to see where the connection to Gilsonite and methane gas, and I found a very interesting article. The info on the website I found interesting was Rice University advances asphalt-based filter to sequester greenhouse gas at Wellhead. The Rice Lab of chemist James Turr discovered that treating grains of inexpensive Gilsonite asphalt with water allows the material to absorb more than two times its weight in greenhouse gas. The treated asphalt selects carbon dioxide over valuable methane at a ratio of more than 200 to 1. 
So basically, at wellhead, gilsonite with water captures the more harmful carbon dioxide, and the main methane gas is able to pass through. It looked further into the basics of carbon dioxide. What can carbon dioxide does to the body? Exposure to CO2 can produce a variety of health effects. These may include headaches, dizziness, restlessness, tinging, tingling, or pins or needles, feeling, difficulty breathing, sweating, etc. What is carbon dioxide and why is it important? A molecule of carbon dioxide is made up of one carbon atom and two oxygen atoms. Carbon dioxide is an important greenhouse gas that helps to trap heat in our atmosphere. Now in regards to the strangeness at Skinwalker Ranch, what if these entities are using the cow's organs to create some kind of organic machine that creates more methane gas on demand and use gilsonite to help extract it even further? I've looked into the cattle mutilations for years and none of it seemed to make sense. If I were an alien being, all I would have to do is steal a few bulls and cows and create my own cattle crop to harvest for them. I wouldn't want to attract too much attention to what we were doing by leaving them all mutilated at the ranch that they were taken from. Why cows though? What possible reason would cow organs be of any use to advanced race other than organs and gas? I'm no scientist and I wish I'd explore. I also found an interesting article in Blue Light Methane Gas, reminding me of the blue orbs seen on the ranch. If you have seen any scientist friends, maybe you can run this info by them. So, I get these kind of letters occasionally, and I read this one because it's from someone who hasn't followed me much. I've stated to you before about mutilated cattle. It's always the same area. The cows are placed back exactly or very close to the spot where they were taken from. And it's not just cows, a variety of animals, even cats and dogs. Now the mutil mutilations, we call them mutilations. What if they were trying to send a scientific message to us that something's wrong with these cows and we need to study history? If you study the USDA and, da and downer cows, that's cows that are allowed to go through the system and for us to eat, even though they're down and almost dead, but they're put through the system at the approval of the USDA. Do some research into that. But decades ago, remember in England, they had a problem with mad cow disease. It's a prion-based disease. And they said that they apparently got it taken care of. And that's it. No more mad cow disease anywhere in the world, supposedly. But we have prion-based disease in the US, chronic wasting disease, and it's out of control. It's gonna kill hundreds of thousands of cervids in the US. So what if there's some entity out there that's trying to inform us, you and me? You know, we're putting this right back in front of your nose. Maybe you ought to be paying attention to why we're doing this. You know, this, if they had the ability to take it and nobody could know that it was taken, nobody hears anything, don't you think they have the ability to put it anywhere they want? But they put it right back in the middle of our world, of the rancher's world? Just saying. Hey Dave, first of all, condolences on the loss of your son Ben. I wish you I wish you great strength every day. I need that. Second, if you read this letter. No, Dave, if you can read this letter, no problem. Dave, I appreciate all your work you do regarding missing 411 and Bigfoot, and it has been an eye opener. I bought all your missing 411 books and I'm currently reading them. I watch all your videos. I am an atheist, but I have not always been an atheist. I suppose I'm just a general theist. I don't believe in proving God exists. It's just my opinion and my choice to have that opinion. Absolutely, that's your choice. There was a time in my life I considered myself an atheist-based Buddhist. and Before that, I was a theistic Christian. I'm not Christian today simply because after much research, my opinion is that Jesus Christ probably never existed. Generally, my opinion is that all a Brahminic religions are myth and there is very little content in the Bible that has any historic historicity. 
That said, I do believe negative paranormal phenomena are real. I believe negative paranormal phenomena are real. Why not positive paranormal phenomena? And that humanity has been trying to cope with this throughout history. So for example, why I don't believe Jesus exists, it appears that Christian exorcism sometimes works. I'm not sure what the purpose of the religions ought to be, as religions seem to meddle far too much into politics. Is it religion meddling into politics? Or the leaders of the religion meddling in politics? In my opinion, probably the most legitimate job of religious clergy is to keep negative paranormal phenomena away from the human family. Call it exorcisms and ghost busting, if you like. I do find it very weird that the further I dive into the rabbit hole, the historicity of history of Jesus Christ, whenever I return to the surface, I'm empty handed, especially in the areas of corroboration. By contrast, going down the rabbit hole of evidence on Sasquatch and UFOs, whenever I return to the surface, I have incredible, compelling evidence and with lots of corroboration. By corroboration, what I mean is stories with lots of commonalities and overlap. And of course, though many deny it, we do have actual hard evidence of Sasquatch and UFOs. I don't care if others believe in Jesus Christ or if they believe in any of the 2,000 plus year old religions, as long as they understand that at the end of the day, their beliefs and the history of it are ultimately just their opinion. Once they say their opinions aren't opinions and insist they are facts, I keep my distance. Regarding your research results, of the suspicious overrepresentation of the disappearance of Germans and physicists, and especially German physicists, I have two ideas about that. Okay. It's my opinion that Jewish people launched a spiritual war against the German people before World War II. It's my, if my opinion is true, it appears the Germans aren't the slightest bit aware of the war against them and what a spiritual war means or even entails. I'm suggesting that one group has petitioned negative paranormal entities to attack another group. Yeah, that's what I'm suggesting. Before anyone says my suggestion is anti-Semitic, it's important to note that these things actually do happen. For example, the history of the Skinwalker Ranch shows the Navajo Utes cursed the Ute Indians. Maybe. If my first opinion is too far afield for some, my second opinion is that perhaps the types of German people that have gone missing have what is called naturalist point of view of the universe. A naturalist divorces all notions of the supernatural and paranormal having an effect on the world. The character of, quote, the professor on the TV show Gilligan's Island is a good example of this. My second opinion is similar to my first, is that a person can't defend themselves from something that is true that they can already disbelieve. In other words, a false prejudgment. I think most people agree that false prejudgments aren't an asset. I would say that the naturalist worldview is a false prejudgment of the world. Now, of course, I have no idea that you could measure my second opinion unless the missing people left behind detailed notes, and they don't. So this is obviously speculation. If you want something to compare a spiritual attack on the German people to, we can easily speculate that the USA is currently under some kind of spiritual attack. I believe so. <laughs> Dave, you got an missing from one episode of Episcopalians that went missing. Obviously, we can't speak for all of them, but generally, Episcopalianism is a liberal form of Christianity. It is basically the American version of the Church of England, and we know that liberalism is usually coupled with a naturalist perspective. Harboring a naturalist point of view should create cognitive dissonance for anyone that purports to be Christian, or any other religion for that matter. In other words, if you're going to believe in dying and rising Savior God, then there is a whole lot of other supernatural concepts you should be open to, but naturalism is the back of your mind. So when religious people go missing, I think it's worth asking, what kind of religious people go missing? I'm not suggesting that only true believers of the right religion have immunity from victimhood. In fact, it's possible that no amount of religion is enough protection. And it's possible that there is no, quote, proper belief system that will protect anyone. Regardless, I think it's worth asking two questions even if we're only left pondering. Okay. Did any one person or any group petition negative paranormal entities against the victim? How would you ever tell? Number two, what was the victim's beliefs about paranormal and supernatural? Can we do armchair speculation? How would you ever know? I mean, those are things that are personal, probably don't talk about to many people. And uh, 
I think if there was a surviving family member, they probably wouldn't be open to talking about it. Just my humble opinion. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you. That was a very interesting note. Hey, Dave, I first want to say that I love the work that you do and put out. I'm really looking forward to your new movie. And please put the trailer on your social media sites, please. I've also started to read through your books and hope to own the whole collection someday. And now, seeing that you have a YouTube channel, I've been enjoying listening, watching your videos. 340 plus on the channel. I wanted to write this email mainly to share something that my grandma said. She was a woman of this tribe, I-N-U-P-I-A-Q. I respect it too much to mispronounce it. Who grew up outside of Nome, Alaska. Her family traveled a lot in that area, and as her father was a reindeer herder and whale hunter, she believed in Bigfoot and would call him Jabberwocky or Skookum. My grandmother related a story that everyone around there knew Bigfoot exists, and in fact, the village children would play with Bigfoot children. Unfortunately, I don't have much more detail than that. She passed away last year. I'm still working through your books and videos, so forgive me if you have ever mentioned some point about native children playing with Bigfoot youth. I may write back another time to tell you Bigfoot stories from my father's experience. Please do. He has seen him twice and has some other non-visual encounters with him as well. He has also captured orbs on trail cams, but I'm not sure if he still has those. As for myself, my experiences are less with Bigfoot and more with paranormal. I've seen things tall standing in the woods, but I can't say if it was Bigfoot. It may have been something else. Just wanted to relate my grandma's story. Thanks. It's a story I wrote about in, uh, I think it was the Hoopa Project, where a family lived right on the edge of the reservation in the woods. And they had a bunch of new puppies, they had like eight or nine puppies. And they uh, just put them outside for a few minutes, get some sun, and they came back and all the puppies were gone. And they lived on a very isolated road in the middle of nowhere. And they knew nobody drove up the road. They knew nobody would take the puppies, but something with hands took the whole box. And there was no blood, there was no squeak and squalling. So they're pretty upset because the puppies were very, very young. They needed their mom. Several days later, the box shows back up and all the puppies are dead. Not from injuries they sustain, but probably from lack of nourishment. And the people in the house said, we think a young Bigfoot took the box of puppies to play with them and didn't realize that you need to nurture them in a certain way. And they just died. I've heard several stories along that same line from people in that area, at different reservations. Totally believe it. I think it makes a lot of sense. So next one. <coughs> Hey Dave, watching one of your videos today, you mentioned if we had any orb stories. Well, it's been around my house for years, nothing spectacular, just orbs, pale blue in color in the woods here. Spring of 2021, I was driving home from work about 11.30 p.m. A strange light enters my car. First of all, I would have crashed my car. Driving along and a blue orb just comes in, goes off, comes back on again, all of this within so it goes on and off, on and off within a 10 mile drive home, no explanation. Mostly backcountry roads. So it doesn't say where this happened at the location in the States, Canada, I don't know. The really bizarre part, if that wasn't really bizarre in and of itself. Same thing happened to my sister on her drive home from work. The same night, almost the same time. She lives in another state 2000 miles from me. I've heard a lot of freaky things in my day, but that's pretty darn freaky if I say so myself. So, next letter. First off, appreciative and grateful for the work you do and share with us. Without you and your platform, we truly would not have the knowledge that you share. Literally, no one else in the world is doing what you've done and continue to do, so thank you. Just wanted to share a thought I had. Not sure if this has ever been brought up in the past, but I've always thought about this. Do you think all of the Federal Reserve lands are reserved specifically for an unknown human species? For example, Native Americans are given reservations to reside in. In the American school system, we were taught about Native Americans. Maybe 
That was decided because Native Americans in physical appearance closely resemble modern man. But on the other hand, Sasquatch, given its mystery and folklore, not to mention its menacing size and appearance, and lack of scientific information, perhaps made the government decide to keep them hidden from general population, not part of the education system. So with the government knowing of the species and knowing they also had to be protected or hidden, maybe that's brought, what brought up the creation of the national parks. Millions and millions of reserved acre land. Most areas, most of us will never step foot on it. In other words, perfect habitat for the hidden species. And ironically, most state parks are near mountain ranges. UFOs and mountains are regularly associated with one another. Hope you had the chance to read this, and if you did, thank you. Hope to hear your thoughts on the day. I have heard that probably 50 times in the last 10 years. And I don't know if I've ever said it live on the air here. I would probably say no, because most of the parks were established late 1800s, early 1900s, and very little talk about Sasquatch and Bigfoot really got going until the 50s out of Canada and then down into the U.S. Yeah, the Native Americans had heard of them, and the First Nations people in Canada have heard of them way before that. But that's when really it started to make news. Now, let's say, for example, that uh, from the very beginning, the press acknowledged their existence, and the press said, yeah, they're just another tribe of people. No big deal. It, it wouldn't have been a big deal. And just like everything else our press does in lying to us and not telling us the truth and thwarting truthful studies and etc many have been taught to believe a certain paradigm about it so until that gets turned around and we get equal time telling the truth the topic is always going to take an unwanted turn that probably wouldn't be truthful Next letter. Hey Dave, I'm a new follower of your channel and have watched many, but not all of your uploaded videos. 340 videos. I'm currently reading the Hoopa Project and a sobering coincidence. So much to read and watch. Thought I'd pass along my, my own experience. Along in the event you have interest, you're a busy man, so I'll get right to it. Growing up, I lived in a rural town in northwest Wisconsin. One summer night, at the age of eight and nine, I was asleep in my bed. At that point, I'd been sleeping with my bedroom door closed. The door was on the same wall as the headboard of my bed. One night, I awoke and looked up to what I thought was my mother looking at me. I only saw the outline of her robe and the bumpy outline of her head. She wore curlers to bed in those days. That would have been around 1973-74. Wouldn't that hurt, laying in bed sleeping like that? How, how would you do that? I then realized mom was not much taller than the door handle. It seemed like the head arm was resting on the doorknob, but I saw no hand. I saw no face. It was wearing what resembled a monk's robe tied to the cord, clenched at the waist area. I tried to yell to my parents, but could not make a sound. For some time, I didn't move. Don't recall if I couldn't or I just didn't want to because I was terrified. Eventually, I was able to throw the covers over my head and turn away to face the wall, away from that thing in my doorway. Somehow I fell asleep. I woke the next morning and kind of laughed to myself thinking it was a dream until I saw the door open the same amount it had been the night before. I questioned my mom and she did not look in on me. No one did. I don't remember much being said about it after that fact. Fast forward a few years and I learned that two female cousins in Milwaukee had an encounter with two to three of the same robed beings. Same approximate height as they walked home from school function earlier that evening. They did see the face that of a typical gray alien. The beings were pulling at something in the bushes in a yard. My cousin screamed and ran. You cannot get them to revisit that story. For some reason. One tears up and the other will not discuss it. And this year I learned that one of my uncles had multiple encounters with the same beings throughout his lifetime. Always during the night. Fast forward to the last year, I heard an interview that George Knapp did with Bob Bigelow, where he asked him what got him interested in the UFO subject. 
He related a story of waking up one night in his bedroom as a kid and seeing three beings in what looked like monks' robes. Dave, I don't know what these things are, but there's something going on here. And they are not here to just check in on us at night. But how do you know that? I read somewhere that they may follow certain family bloodlines. Could be. I thought about doing hypnotic regression, but do I want to know more? Yes or no? My family has had many UFO sightings, larger than Wisconsin, an area with a lot of water. My mother, grandmother, aunts, brothers, and cousins, all on my mother's side of the family. I don't think it's a coincidence. I'm 57 year old female of Croatian and German heritage, Germans on my dad's side also very near the Great Lakes. I haven't told many people about this and only recently have shared it with close friends. People like to pass it off as sleep paralysis. If that's the case, would different people see the same beings in their bedrooms? I think not. I have had many more experiences, mostly sightings, but also an unshakable feeling that these things are sometimes around me. I just say prayers and so far it seems to work. Anywhere, Dave, there it is. Thanks for all the time and effort you put into researching this puzzle. It's quite a bit down the rabbit hole. May God give you the strength and keep you and yours safe in these disturbing times. Enjoy your huck. She is adorable. I do believe dogs are angels and fur coats. I also believe we will all see our loved ones again when that veil is lifted. So, thanks for that. Now, at the beginning of the program, I told you guys that uh, over the years, you've sent in a lot of stories. And sometimes people say, well, I don't know if this matches the profile, but yeah, yeah. Well, I understand. And I usually don't talk about new stories because so much can happen after a body's found, let's say. But, I'm going to talk about a new story today. But let me first tell you about a story that came into me from a villager in France. It's about a lady named Marcel, and it, she spelled her last name P-E-Y-C-E-R-E, -E -E, from France, from the Paris area. She was 80 years old, missing August 2nd, 2007. She had two sons, 80 years old, so she was old. And she'd been a music teacher for 50 years. And four months out of the year, she went to this specific region of France to live away from the urban area of Paris. She was described as an extraordinarily good health. Get this, she could walk 12 kilometers a day at 80 years old. So, where was she? Well, I'm going to... I'm going to show you on a map, because my French is horrible. So, this is Marseille, France. And then she was from, she was in this area of north central France. Okay. Give you another look at this. And she was in an area near Ma Mount Ventoux, V-E-N-T-O-U-X. She drove her car up to a trailhead and started to hike. On August 2nd, 2007, she drove her Fiat to a location called Roland Pavilion, parked the car, locked it, and took off for her hike. People that she lived around during those four months knew that she'd be back every night in her Fiat parked in front of her house. That night she didn't come back. They called the gendarmes. The gendarmes went and searched for her car on August 3rd and found it at the trailhead, they thought. And from there, they called her sons and they were searching the south slope of Mount Ventoux. Well, in France, they used soldiers to do the searching. And they called in 30 soldiers with two helicopters and multiple canine teams. And they searched for four days. They didn't believe that she was gonna go off trail. 
They didn't believe that she was going to go past more than 10 kilometers max that day. She was 3,000 meters above sea level, which was a lot for anybody at that point. Well, they didn't find anything. The canines did hit on one area, so they put all of their resources into this one area to search and they found nothing. And there wasn't another canine team that had a hit, it was only one. But on August 7th, it's five days after she went missing, some hikers were in the area where the search had been going on when they found her body, quote, on the edge of the path. The head searcher stated, I quote, we went into that area several times. I don't understand it, quote, said the enraged Lieutenant Pollen, enraged. Said that a dog hit on a scent 50 meters from the location where she was found. We've sent a huge amount of resources into the area and never found her. And then she's found on the edge of the trail. Hmm. It would appear that in 15 years, the government in France has never released her cause of death, which is interesting. They also never released what they found her wearing or the condition of her body other than they saw no signs of violence. So what happened to her? Yeah. A realistically good question. Uh, somebody who had lived 80 years through multiple wars to think that she's going to die in a trail where she normally walks 12 kilometers a day doesn't make a lot of sense. And especially since multiple canine teams couldn't pick up her track, pick her scent, and follow it. Puzzling, to say the least. Now, about a month ago, uh, maybe three weeks ago, I get a call from a friend of mine who uh, works at Mossy Oak Corporation. He's a VP there. And he says, hey, Dave, uh, somebody else who works in the company just came back from Alaska searching for a friend of theirs that disappeared. Can you communicate with him and find out what you can about the case? I said, for sure. That led into a series of lengthy emails with getting me to try to understand what happened on this incident. It's a little confusing, but I've got the handle on it. And maybe you can help if you're in Alaska. So, where did this happen? So, this is Prudhoe Bay, Dead Horse, Alaska. This is pump station number two of the Alaska pipeline. And this is the Dalton Highway, Highway 11. So it's in this area right here where this man that I'm going to tell you about and a friend of his took a turn off and then hiked five miles in and went caribou hunting. So pump station two, that's a general area, general area. There's also a small airstrip down here that's also in that same general area. The airstrip is on the uh, east side of the road. They were on the west side of the road. So here's how the story goes. It involves this man right here. Steve Keel, 61 years old. He was raised on a family farm in Dover, Tennessee. And he, he turned out to be an electrician. He married a couple older boys. And he went with a friend of his to the hunting grounds south of Dead Horse, Alaska. And he went, was going to go hunting for caribou. And he was on hunting grounds 26B, as in boy. He was with a friend named Brian Collins. And each of them had shot a caribou early in their hunt. They arrived there on August 20th of this year. Well, each shot a caribou on different days. And they packed it into a specific area outside their camp. So... Obviously, if there's bears around, you don't want them coming into camp. So they left what meat behind, came into camp, spent the night, and then they went back and got their meat and were going to carry it five miles and take it back to their car. The camp was about five miles from the Dalton Highway. So as they're packing 
their caribou back to the area of the camp from where they had shot it, Steve gets really tired. And he says, hey, I'm going to put my camp or my pack down. I'll come back for it the next day after we sleep up and I'll get, we're not so tired. His partner says, hey, understandable. Let's, let's make it to camp. So they make it to camp, sleep. Very early the next day, Steve takes off. Brian tells him, hey, if you get lost or something, fire off a couple rounds. Steve had his pistol. It was six tenths of a mile from the camp to where the backpack was located. So Steve goes out, doesn't come back. Well, Brian thinks, well, maybe he just bypassed our camp and went back to the car on the Dalton Highway. So Brian makes a four hour hike to their van on the Dalton Highway and Steve's not there. He's exhausted, it's dark. He says, I'll just wait here, and hope that Steve will make it back here. Well, Steve never made it back to the car. Brian calls for assistance. After that morning, he goes back to camp to make sure that Steve didn't make it to that camp five miles back. This guy was a stud. And when he's at camp five miles from the Dalton Highway, he activates his personal locator beacon. That's how he told search and rescue he needed help. And then he continued searching. Now, Steve had a personal lo locator beacon and he had GPS that he left in his tent when he went to go get his caribou meat. And the theory behind that was it was only six tenths of a mile away and there was no way he was going to get lost. Well, 30 hours after activating the personal locator beacon, the first searchers arrive on scene and are getting ready to go and look for Steve. Now, these lands, you need authority to take a canine onto them. And it appears that they're either First Nations lands or they're controlled by something where the Alaska State Troopers don't have authority to bring their canines onto them. And they were not given authority to take their canines on and search for Steve, which really torqued me up. So all search and rescue was done initially by the Coast Guard, Civil Air Patrol, and the North Slope Search and Rescue. There were 40 plus air search hours contributed to finding, the, finding Steve. Now, Brian was still out there searching. Uh, Steve's family heard about what was happening and his two sons got on a plane, flew it straight out to Alaska, started to help with the search. And then my contact heard that the initial search and rescue failed, the secondary search by the sons were failing. So my contact goes out and gets three guys that a former military experience, they fly up there and they start searching for another week. It's a big effort. A lot of love out there for Steve. And all of these searchers were from Dover, Tennessee. The ping on Steve's cell phone was 10 days earlier, and that was the last one it was in Fairbanks, even though he supposedly had the phone with him. A lot of people have asked, well, what about Maybe he was eaten by a bear or some bear predation that went on. It was specifically stated by Brian and search and rescue that were there that there were no bears seen the entire time he and Steve were in the area. There was no bear scat. There was no bear tracks. And uh, the piles of remains from the caribou that they left in the wild were untouched. The gut piles weren't touched by anything. So Brian stayed behind to assist with search and rescue. Now Steve, he was a former Marine, older man, 61, but still in really good shape. A very experienced outdoorsman. It was described as fresh water everywhere. And when you look at a map, there's water everywhere. Now, interestingly, is that there's also blueberries everywhere out there and people said that he could have fed himself for a week or two weeks on all the amount of berries that are available in that area 
So Steve's friends from Dover that got there that had the military experience, they searched, they ran grid patterns, they sent me their grid patterns, they did a heck of a job. Uh, North Slope Search and Rescue did a heck of a job. And I think it should be noted that if you can see Steve's face, his nickname was Smiley. Had a great attitude, always smiling, loved the outdoors. Now, if you live in Alaska, I know the weather's starting to turn up there, but there's still some time. Steve's wife is in a bad way. Uh, she has asked anybody to help find her husband. She, sh she should be able to find him. I think he's out there. And when you look at the landscape, there's no big trees. There's no place really to hide. I, I personally don't understand why they didn't find tracks. And it really gets me mad that in order to save a life, you can't allow a canine to come in. It's freaking ridiculous. I don't know who's making that decision, but I think it's obscene. Uh, if you live in Alaska, get up north, talk to North Slope Search and Rescue, get out their uh, search and rescue logs, and you can see what was searched. My guess is he's probably within two miles of the camp that he left that morning. Maybe less, because remember the pile or the backpack he was looking for was only six tenths of a mile. Now I realize that area has been soaked with searchers so many times. People are found in areas that have been previously searched. So our prayers go out to Steve Keel and his family. And a big thank you to all of the people that went out and searched. Let's see if we can get another group out there searching. It can be done. Now, last missing person upload, I talked about Yosemite. And I'm gonna be talking about it again today in another missing person case. And Dave, why talk about Yosemite? Well, if you've never been there, a river goes through the bottom of Yosemite Valley. And the first time you're there, it's pretty imposing because you have these solid granite cliffs going up a thousand feet, higher, huge cliffs, half dome, solid pieces of granite and water right at the bottom of the valley. I don't think I've ever been around more granite than I've seen in Yosemite. And Yosemite is the largest cluster of missing people anywhere in the world. Now, a lot of people say, well, Dave, you know, Yosemite is a really big place and you know, you can hike into the back country. Just, no, hold on. A lot of the people I've talked to you about that I've written about have disappeared right in that valley floor. Going on a couple hour hike, gonna walk up to this trailhead, gonna walk a trail where thousands of people have walked it a week, and all of a sudden, boom, gone. Makes no sense. So this case involves a man who is a chef from the city of San Francisco, David Paul Morrison, 28 years old. He went missing May 25th, 1998. He and his girlfriend needed to have a getaway. They had been working real hard, and so he said, I'm gonna take you to Yosemite. Well, David had lived in Fresno with his family before he moved to San Francisco. Fresno was very close to Yosemite, he had been there many times. Well, on the 25th, that was Memorial Day weekend in 98. And David had told his girlfriend the night before that he was going to get up early, about 5.30, so he wouldn't waste the whole day. And he'd get up, and he was going to climb Half Dome and be back by that afternoon. And he said that, uh, don't worry, easy hike, well, strenuous hike, on a known trail where there's a lot of people, I'll be back. And he leaves wearing a sweatshirt, black pants, and Nike tennis shoes. Well, his girlfriend goes out and does some things that day, comes back mid-afternoon, waits, waits, 4 p.m., Dave hadn't returned. She waits a little bit more and gets nervous and calls the National Park Service. She described Dave as a very experienced hiker, in good shape, and a known outdoorsman. He knows his way around. 
So he disappears on the 25th. On the 26th, the National Park Service co commits 100 ground searchers, five canine teams, and the CHP helicopter out of Sacramento. And they believe they found some tracks near the beginning of the Half Dome Trailhead. Now, it's about this time that Yosemite know, calls China Mountain Rescue, and they requested 20 respond to the valley and help. And they got 20. And those are some of the better search and rescue people that they could have gotten. So, give you some perspective here. All of the brown you see here, that's really giant granite mountains coming up out of the valley floor. And then through the bottom of the valley here is the Merced River. And the big monument spots that everyone would know is the Awani Hotel, Yosemite Valley, Sentinel Point, and the Half Dome Trailhead is over here. Now, if you've never climbed it, I'll explain it to you. It's not a real trail, per se, because you're walking right on the side of Half Dome, right on the side of granite. And what the Park Service has done is drilled into the side of the granite a cable that you hold onto for your very life at times, and you climb the side of Half Dome. Pretty strenuous, definitely worth it, absolutely gorgeous. Now the Park Service says that on that day, the 26th, they thought they found Dave's tracks right near the bottom where the trailhead starts. And that would make sense because after you're on the side of it, there's no tracks, there's no nothing. So they keep searching. And about the second day of the search, bad weather hits the area and it was unexpected and it greatly inhibited all search efforts. Now the National Park Service went around and was looking for witnesses to anybody who had seen Dave on the side of Half Dome. Nobody had. Nobody, the article stated that nobody understood how a hiker could get lost on this trail. I don't either. Now Tom Roseman was the head of National Park Service operations and he gave a quote to papers. He said, during the middle of the search, quote, we had problems with our GPS units and all the stored data we had on this search was lost. Oh, uh, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I've never heard that one. How could all of your GPS data be lost? So everybody has a GPS unit and it monitors your actions all day, coming up, walking 200 feet that way, making a right turn three feet, making a right turn, and then walking another 200 feet that way. And it shows this red pattern that everyone took, takes. And then they usually download that to a master so that they can see on their map all the different locations where people have walked red patterns. Okay. So I still have my grid pattern right here. But how could that grid pattern and the one I gave to you with all the master, how could that all disappear? I've never heard that happen. But what I have heard happening is electronic issues associated with many searches that I've written about. Many. Compass issues. Many. Now, is this related? Well, it's a search. And there are many things about David's disappearance that match the 411 profile. Canines never pick up a scent. So how could four or five canine teams not pick up Dave's scent if they found his track at the bottom of the trailhead? If they found that, then he was there. Now the Park Service did something in this case very rare and very dangerous to do. They didn't find Dave. After about a week, they gave up the search. And after they gave up the search, they throw a tidbit out to the news, saying that, well, there were rumors he was depressed. And the news ran with it. With the implication being, oh, he went and killed himself. That's what he did. Yeah, that's what he did. 
It's an obscene thing to do. Somebody was depressed. It's none of the press's business. And I question whether that's a HIPAA violation by the National Park Service police. Why would you have the need to say that to the press? Except to give it an excuse about why you couldn't find somebody. There's no need to tell anyone that. Let's put it this way. There's a, one of those National Park Service police officers that was doing the search that hasn't been depressed at some point in their life. Not one. So just because Dave was depressed doesn't answer the million dollar question about why searchers couldn't find him or why canines, multiple canines, couldn't find a scent. Yeah, exactly. I think the National Park Service needs to clean up their act a little bit and how they address these topics. And rather than state their own ineptitude, try to make it appear as though somebody may have taken their life. I don't like that at all. So, David Paul Morrison, missing May 25th, 1998, in essentially Yosemite Valley. And his girlfriend eventually had to go back to San Francisco without her boyfriend. His parents in Fresno had to live a life without him. It's been 14 years. His body's never been found. Where could he have gone? Think about that. And remember, there's a whole bunch of people missing in Yosemite that have never been found. And David Paul Morrison, one more. Then you have Steve Keel, missing from Prudhoe Bay, Alaska. Then you have Marcel Pesir, who went missing in France, was eventually found after several days in an area that had been previously searched probably 20 times. So, those are the three cases for today. Tried to mix it up with some uh, new ones and some older ones, but try not to get so hmm, hardened to missing people. Because each one of these people, they had a family. They've got to live with the unknown about what happened. And Mrs. Keel, still living in Dover, Tennessee, Thought her husband was just going to go away for a couple weeks hunting, and he never comes back. I don't even get that. I, that's a hard thing to do. So friends, big favor. As villagers, we have to do each other favors. Please post this on all your social media sites, and specifically post the trailer to our movie on there. That's really important. And Read the questions and the statements that are placed below each one of these posts by villagers and friends and me. I'll usually put a post that's a number one post right at where the statements start. And uh, feel free to jump in. I usually take down 10, 15 comments of, that are obscene, angry, rude, because I don't want you to see them. And I don't want you to have to be inhibited by what you're going to say about something. I think you're going to be attacked. Not going to happen on my channel. So, love your family. Do something nice for someone today. we got pretty nice weather here. It's been windy the last day, but other than that, we have it pretty nice. Hopefully, I'll get you outdoors in the next few days. In the meantime, be safe. Light us out.